Before the Second World War, Europe was home to roughly 9 to 12 million Jewish people. There were Jewish communities in every European country, but the largest Jewish population, more than 3 million, was in Poland. In the countries of Eastern Europe, Jewish communities formed an important part of life in all the big cities, as well as in many smaller towns and villages. It was a lively world that hummed with different ideas about how to live a good life. The majority continued to live their lives much as their parents and grandparents had before them. But others turned their backs on traditional beliefs and ways of life. Instead, they joined mainstream society or became members of political movements that held the promise of a brighter future. Not only for Jewish people, but for mankind as a whole. So, across Europe, there were many different ways of being Jewish. There were Jewish people who were deeply religious, those who marked just a few religious festivals, and atheists who didn't believe in God at all. All belonged to a wider world that could be hostile, even dangerous. This evening's Holocaust Memorial Day commemoration is being live streamed. Some of the readings have been pre-recorded. Some footage has been used from previous years. Our youth readers this evening are all winners of the Mary Elms Prize in Holocaust Studies. Every year on this evening of commemoration, we solemnly mark Holocaust Memorial Day here in Dublin. We remember six million Jewish people murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators. And we remember the millions of other persecuted minorities who were victims of Nazi atrocities. This evening's ceremony provides us with the opportunity to cherish the memory of those who perished and to reflect on the consequences of the Holocaust today. I invite the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Caroline Conroy, to welcome you. On behalf of the city and people of Dublin, it is a great honour to host this important national event, which is held every year in the round room at the Mansion House. We feel privileged to be among survivors of the Holocaust and descendants of survivors who have made Dublin and Ireland their home. We welcome representatives of all of the victim groups who live among us here in Ireland. Holocaust Memorial Day marks the date of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau on the 27th of January 1945. Tonight, we recall the suffering inflicted on the Jewish people of Europe and on those of other faiths and ethnicities persecuted during the Holocaust. We reflect on this and on the suffering still being inflicted on people throughout the world today. We acknowledge the work of the Holocaust Education Ireland in its endeavours to educate and inform about the Holocaust and ensure that it is never denied or distorted, but always remembered. Professor Thomas O'Dowd, Chairperson of Holocaust Education Ireland, will introduce this evening of remembrance. The Holocaust was not intended to have any witnesses. The Nazi plan was to erase an entire people from the history and memory of the world. The Jews were not supposed to survive. Everything was planned, thought out, and organized so as not to leave any evidence of the murderous project. The existence of the gas chambers was kept hidden like a state secret. The Nazi death machine was designed to eradicate not only Jews, Roma and other peoples, but also all evidence of their annihilation. Individuals, groups and governments made choices that allowed hatred to flourish 
and ultimately sanctioned mass murder. With few Holocaust survivors left to carry the burden of memory, the lessons of history grow dangerously dim. It becomes even more important to educate generations now living. We urge all young people in our midst to speak out against the scourge of misinformation, anti-Semitism, denial and distortion of the Holocaust. Antishik Leo Varadkar will now address us. Ardvera, Ara, Echakti, Aguinusa Galer. Escus, Honor Domve, Elohar, Trenona New, Conajaravu, Gajin Valcha, Keiko Tamanta, August Keiko Digersach, Isatomid Kun, Antilla Husku, Kamora. Lord Mayor, Ministers, Public Reps, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honoured to be here this evening to reaffirm Ireland's resolute commitment to reflecting and commemorating the Holocaust. As we gather here this evening in the round room in the Mansion House, we remember the unspeakable atrocities that took place 75 years ago. We remember the millions of lives that were lost, those lives lost to prejudice and hatred, is quibbling Nadine of Four Boss. I'm grateful that some of Ireland's Holocaust survivors have joined us this evening. Your powerful and personal testimony is a poignant and heartbreaking reminder of why it's so important that we continue to gather this Sunday every year. Through speech, reconciliation, readings and music, we pause to reflect and remember. In remembering the millions of Jewish people who were persecuted and murdered, we also remember all of the victims who suffered because of their ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, political affiliations or beliefs. In doing so, we renew our moral and legal commitment to respond and reflect and react to all types of prejudice and hatred. It's important that societies never forget the extent of the atrocities of the Holocaust that new generations understand the pain and suffering that people can inflict on each other. The Holocaust, the Shoah, was a unique event in history when the Nazis tried to extinguish an entire people. That was their design, genocide until nobody was left. So there would be no witnesses and no memory. The scale of that is hard to comprehend six million Jewish men and women were murdered, equivalent almost to the entire population of our island. As Ireland marks 50 years of our membership of the European Union, the origins of the European Union are as relevant today as they ever were. It was born out of war, above all a peace project, Europe saying never again would such things happen on our continent. Peace is fragile, the rule of law, democracy and human rights must be actively protected, and vigilance remains the price of freedom. This year, the need to remember the horrors of the Holocaust seemed particularly significant. The need to be ever vigilant, to truly understand the extent of the dangers of dehumanizing individuals. Russia's evil and brutal war against Ukraine has resulted in the biggest displacement in Europe that we've seen since World War II, and the largest influx of refugees that Ireland has ever experienced. Europe has acted with unity of purpose, and Ireland is steadfast in its commitment to Ukraine and our welcome for the Ukrainian people. Racism and hatred and violence can never be tolerated. Our strong commitment to the commemoration of the Holocaust involves combating all forms of anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia, and intolerance in society. As we see from the events in Jerusalem this week, the killing of Jews at prayer, we know that anti-Semitism remains prevalent in the world. And around the world, the fight against issues like anti-Semitism, ethnic cleansing, genocide, racism, xenophobia, and other expressions of hatred continues. The ever-growing presence of hate speech, ever compounded by conflict, racism, and misogyny, threatens our fundamental aspirations under the UN Charter. 
to safeguard human rights and achieve fundamental freedoms for all, without distinction as to race, gender, sexual orientation or religion. Fundamental to combating these issues and achieving these freedoms is a commitment to promote remembrance and education about the catastrophic events, in particular the Holocaust, in our schools and universities and communities. We must ensure that future generations understand and recognise the ideologies, the actions and beliefs that led to atrocities such as the Holocaust. In October 2021, at the Malmo International Forum on Holocaust Remembrance, the government made a pledge. This pledge reinforced our commitment to legislating against hate crime and hate speech. And Ireland is honoured to join over 27 countries in the largest decentralised memorial in the world, the Stolpersteiner Project, which bears witness to the lives and stories of the victims of the Holocaust. Holocaust education in Ireland held a significant commemoration in June of last year in memory of some of the Irish victims of the Holocaust, with the unveil unveiling of six Stolpersteine at St. Catherine's School in Dublin 8. We're very grateful for the work that Holocaust Education Ireland does in order to remember and commemorate those lives, and we are pleased to lend our support to the inspiring Crocus Project. This project reaches more than 100,000 people across Europe, young people rather, and provides a tangible way to promote a message of tolerance, respect, education and remembrance. Ireland also supports through our embassy in Warsaw, the Auschwitz-Birkenau Foundation, which works for the conservation and preservation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration sites. In concluding, Thank you again for the invitation to attend this evening with you. Every year we must continue to stop, pause and reflect. We must never lose sight of why we attend every year. The pain and suffering caused by the Holocaust is immeasurable, but our response is not. And so Ireland remains committed to the Holocaust remembrance and to fighting anti-Semitism and racism wherever we see it. Gurmil Mahagiv Galer. The Stockholm Declaration, of which Ireland is a signatory, is an international intergovernmental agreement between countries, committing them to commemorate and educate about the Holocaust. Mr. Roderick O'Gorman, Minister for Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth, will read an extract from that important document. We, the governments attending the Stockholm International Forum on the Holocaust, recognize that it was a tragically defining episode of the 20th century, a crisis for Europe and a universal catastrophe. The unprecedented character of the Holocaust fundamentally challenged the foundations of civilization. After more than half a century, it remains an event close enough in time that survivors can still bear witness to the horrors that engulfed the Jewish people. The terrible suffering of millions of Jews and other victims of the Nazis has left an indelible stain across Europe and must forever be seared in our collective consciousness. The selfless sacrifices of those who defied the Nazis and sometimes gave their own lives to protect or rescue Holocaust victims must also be inscribed in our hearts. We pledge to strengthen our efforts to promote education, remembrance and research about the Holocaust in our schools, universities, communities and other institutions. With humanity still scarred by anti-Semitism, genocide, ethnic cleansing, racism, xenophobia, and other expressions of hatred, we commit to fight against these evils and reaffirm our common aspiration for a democratic and tolerant society, free of prejudice and other forms of bigotry.
A handful of Jewish Holocaust survivors live in Ireland. All of them were children during the time of the Holocaust, and all of them found their way to Ireland by different means. Each of them lost many family members in the Shoah, and each has his or her own personal tale of survival. Tommy Reichenthal came to Ireland in 1959. For 50 years, he didn't speak about his experiences during the Holocaust. I'm here today not because of who I am, but because what I am. I'm a Jew, and I am a survivor of the Holocaust. I was born in Slovakia in 1935. I was just nine years old when I was captured by the Nazis along with my mother, brother, grandmother, aunt and cousin. We were herded into cattle cars, and from that moment onwards, we were treated worse than animals. There was no privacy or hygiene. The stench and condition were unbearable. Eventually, after seven nights, the cattle train stopped. The door was open, and we were greeted with shout from the SS, with gun pointing and barking dogs. We had arrived at our destination, Belgian Belsen concentration camp. I was there from November 1944 until the liberation of the camp in April 1945. What I witness as a nine-year-old boy is impossible to describe. The starvation, the cruelty of the camp guard, the cold and disease, people who were just skin and bone and look like living skeleton were walking around very slowly some of them dropping to the ground, never to get up again. They were dying in the hundreds. Their emaciated bodies left where they fell or thrown into heaps. In front of our barracks, there were piles of decomposing corpses. For many prisoners in Belgium, Belgium, the conditions were too much to bear, and they threw themselves on the barbed wire at night to be shot in order to put an end to their misery. We found their corpses there in the morning. 70,000 prisoners of Belgian Belsen are buried there in mass grave. I lost 35 members of my family in the Holocaust. The boycotts of Jewish businesses and professions introduced in April 1933 were soon followed by book burnings throughout Germany, and these heralded the introduction of further anti-Jewish measures by the Nazis. I invite Mary Rose Dooley, journalist and writer, to give her reading. Jewish religious books, books by Jewish authors and books about Jews 
were burned in public bonfires along with other books by authors who the Nazis condemned as degenerate or un-German. Book burnings took place throughout Germany where some of the finest works of literature, history, philosophy, science and art were all destroyed. This was intended to leave Jews and Germans bereft of learning about their culture, their history and their heritage. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 had a profound impact on German Jews. I invite Anna Maria Biro, president of the Tom Lantos Institute in Budapest, to tell us about them. Youth reader Orla O'Donovan will read about exclusion. The Nuremberg Laws were designed to make Jewish people disappear from German society. Jews were deprived of their German citizenship. Jewish people were prohibited from marrying or having relationships with non-Jewish Germans. This law was soon extended to include Roma, black people and other ethnic minorities. For the first time, Jews were defined as a race. As restrictions tightened, Jews found it increasingly difficult to earn a living. They were no longer able to work in the civil service, in academia or the media. Jewish businesses were appropriated by the Nazi state and Jewish banks and bank accounts held by Jews were confiscated. The Nuremberg laws disenfranchised Jews and deprived them of their civil rights and their human rights. Jews were forbidden from public places, such as cinemas, theatres, cafes, ice rinks, swimming pools or public parks, where benches had not for Jews stenciled onto them. Jews were not allowed to participate in sports or ride on trams, keep pets, own radios or bicycles. Increasingly, Jewish people were excluded from German society. By July 1938, Pressure increased on Jews to leave Germany and German-occupied lands. Hundreds of thousands tried to flee. Anticipating a Jewish refugee crisis, President Roosevelt convened an international conference in France to discuss offering refuge to Jewish people. I invite Jackie O'Halloran Bernstein of the Human Rights Unit in the Department of Foreign Affairs to give her reading. Thirty-two countries were represented at the Evian Conference, including Ireland. Delegates were asked if they would accept Jewish refugees. Most countries said they had no room for Jews or that their quotas were already full. One country even stated that no Jew is too many. With nowhere to turn, Jews found themselves trapped within their own borders. Today, people are still fleeing discrimination, persecution, tyranny and war, desperate to find refuge, somewhere safe. The state-sanctioned violence of the November pogrom in 1938 marked a turning point in Nazi persecution of Jewish people. Kim Bielenberg, whose maternal grandfather, Fritz Dietloff von der Schulenberg, participated in the plot to assassinate Hitler in, in July 1944, will give his reading. The November pogrom known as Kristallnacht erupted across Germany and Austria as the SS, Nazi police, Hitler youth and locals 
rampaged through the streets on that November night. Hundreds of synagogues, Jewish schools, and businesses were destroyed and set ablaze. Windows were smashed, leaving the streets strewn with glass. Over a thousand Jews were beaten to death and some 30,000 Jewish men were thrown into concentration camps. Jewish cemeteries were desecrated and thousands of apartments and shops belonging to Jewish people were looted. After the destruction, the Jewish communities were fined one billion Reichsmarks to pay for the damage. After years of official harassment of Jews in Nazi Germany, the state-sanctioned violence of Kristallnacht marked the acceleration of Jewish persecution that would ultimately culminate in the Holocaust. Everyone in Germany was required to carry identity papers, but special identifying marks were added to those of Jewish people. A large red letter J was stamped on Jewish passports, and the middle names of Sarah for females and Israel for males were introduced. In Poland, blue stars of David on white armbands were made compulsory, and in most countries under Nazi control, Jews were forced to wear yellow stars of David on their outer clothing. I invite youth reader Jacob Lachlan to read from the diary of 15-year-old Yitzhak from Poland. The decree was issued that the Vilna Jewish population must put on badges front and back. I was ashamed to appear in them on the street, not because it would be noticed that I am a Jew, but because I was ashamed of what they were doing to us. I was ashamed of our helplessness. More than a thousand ghettos were created throughout Nazi-occupied Europe, usually in cities or large towns, often close to railways. From there, thousands would be deported to killing sites or death camps. I invite Brendan Teeling from Dublin City Council to give his reading. Youth reader Maria Rimashevska will read from the diary of 13-year-old Eva. Jews, Roma, communists, homosexuals and political opponents of the regime were incarcerated in the Nazi ghetto ghettos, which were created in every country occupied by Germany. More than a million people died in them. Many ghettos were walled in or fenced off, and inmates who left them without permission were severely punished, often shot. The brutality, harsh living conditions, starvation and disease added to the death toll. It suited the Nazis if they could claim that people in the ghettos were dying from natural causes. The inhabitants of the ghettos, who came from all walks of life, soon realized that the ghettos served as a place to destroy them physically and psychologically, and their ultimate fate would be death. Although there are heroic stories of resistance, most of them failed. In the end, all of the ghettos created by the Nazis were razed and their populations murdered. There were few survivors. We are here five days, but it seems like five years. First, the fence was finished and nobody can go out or come in. And on every house, they've posted a notice which tells us exactly what we are allowed to do. Actually, everything is forbidden. But the most awful thing is that the punishment for everything is death. It doesn't actually say that this punishment also applies to children, but I think it does apply to us too. There were thousands of concentration camps, labor camps, and transit camps within the Nazi camp system. They were run by the SS, and many also had several sub-camps. Hundreds of thousands of prisoners succumbed to brutality, starvation, cold and disease in these places of incarceration. In July 1941, Germany swept into the Eastern Territories and Russia. 
The German army was followed by special killing units called Einsatzgruppen, taxed with killing Jews in all the towns and villages they passed through. The killing squads were made up of Nazis, SS, police officers, members of the German army, and hundreds of local collaborators. They rounded up Jews in shettles, towns, and villages, forcing them into cemeteries, forests, and ravines, where they were murdered in their thousands at point-blank range. Many were forced to dig mass graves before being shot into them. Entire Jewish communities, totaling some two million Jews, as well as thousands of other victims, were annihilated in this method of face-to-face -face killing. Word reached Berlin that some members of the killing squads found their work distressing. They asked head office to find a more efficient way of murdering Jews. And so the Wannsee Conference was convened on the 20th of January, 1942. I invite Nora Owen, former Minister for Justice, to tell us about the meeting. Reinhard Heydrich, Chief of the Reich Security Main Office, summoned 15 delegates to a meeting in a lakeside villa at Wannsee outside Berlin. He asked them to endorse Hitler's plans for the total annihilation of the Jewish people of Europe. Eichmann presented the delegates with a list of the number of Jews living in each European country who the Nazis intended to murder. Ireland appears on the list with a total of 4,000 Jews. The inclusion of Ireland on the Wannsee list has huge significance for the Irish Jewish community had the war taken a different course and the Nazis not been defeated. The delegates debated who was Jewish according to bloodline considerations and discussed evacuation and resettlement, euphemisms for murder. They concluded that a more efficient method of killing was possible, one that would produce little residue and spare those operating the killing sites the negative psychological trauma of face-to-face -face killing. In less than two hours, the delegates gave their unanimous support for the implementation of the final solution to the Jewish question, the establishment of death camps in which Jewish people and other victims would be murdered by poison gas. Death camps were established where millions of Jews and other victims were murdered in gas chambers. The killing squads continued to operate in rural areas in the east until 1945, in parallel to the murders taking place in the killing centres. I invite Ken McHugh of Sport Against Racism Ireland to tell us about the death camps. Youth reader Kelly Donnellan will read from the memoir of Kitty Hart Moxon from Poland, who was 16 years old when she was imprisoned in Auschwitz-Birkenau. She still talks about her experience. Six dead camps were created by the Nazis, all of them on Polish soil, where approximately three million Jews and thousands of other victims were murdered in gas chambers. Prisoners were selected for life or death. 90% were selected to die. They were ushered into undressing areas where they were told to leave their clothes neatly on the numbered pegs and to tie their shoes together to make them easier to find when they come back from the showers. They never came back. Their clothing, shoes, and their personal belongings were sorted and sold in markets back in Germany. Human hair was used in the manufacture of textiles. This systematic industrial process of murder was unprecedented in human history. 
As evening came, the whole sky was red. Smoke and flames were pouring out of all the chimneys. Here were the death factories. Today, in 2023, it is barely credible to someone like myself, who lived through the worst of it, that members of a younger generation cannot believe it happened at all. But I did live through it, and I do know it happened, because I was there. I invite Judith Mock, classical singer and author, to read from her book, The State of Dark, written in tribute to the 163 members of her family who were murdered in the Holocaust. With the devastating speed, time has pulled me back to April 1944. I'm still holding the phone with a shaking hand, and as tears start streaming down my face, I can see myself sitting in the space of a cold fact. My room has faded, my life has faded. Now I am the family member who knows exactly what happened to them, my close relatives. I try to find my voice, thanking the kind lady who must by now be used to her thankless task of telling the horrible truth. I also understand suddenly why my father did not get any details about his parents' death, whether they were gone or not. They didn't get a number and slipped through the mesh of the well-organized German administration. I talk and the lady agrees with me. She has something to add, though. Would I like to get an email with a list of all the disappeared family members? I don't understand what she's saying. The landscape outside is blurry. My head is swimming. I stammer, all right, and hang up to open my email. While I sit reading, nailed to my chair, rows and rows of names appear on my screen. All these family members, babies, teenagers, aunts, uncles, cousins. My notebook is open and I start making a small mark on a blank page for each person that died. Sobibor, Auschwitz, Mauthausen, Trobitz, Treblinka. I count 163. Checking and checking again through unstoppable tears, I get up to wash my face and look up in the bathroom mirror, only to see myself again and ask myself, why? I sit down on my bed and unconsciously stroke my grandfather, Heyman's Talit, the prayer shawl he should have been buried in. Instead, it had been smuggled through the war by my father and is now covering the end of my bed. Only now do I realize that it might be time for me to speak where my parents stayed stumm in order to let their new post-war life take over. The silence they carried around with them was filled to the brim with dead voices. I read my father's extensive literary work and I listened to my mother's stories, but they passed on this terrible silence to me. Why speak? Why tell the tale told so many times already by great writers or courageous survivors? I ask myself this, feeling completely flat and empty. It is because my parents' war wounds were so thinly healed that revealing them would have, without a doubt, killed them. Because everything they loved and stood for in their life and culture had been destroyed in order to reduce them to barbarians themselves. Because using their strength to try and convince us of the, important, of an, of the importance of an open, free and deep understanding of life, they had pushed away what they missed. Also, because they and their families had brought so much to their country, a richness in culture and love that took just a few minutes to wipe out the scratch marks of nails on the filthy wall of a Nazi gas chamber were supposed to be their legacy. Instead, I have to believe that they would have liked for me to write their testament. The Holocaust was unprecedented in its planning, execution, 
and in its intent to destroy the entire Jewish people, their culture and their history. Morris Cohen, chairperson of the Jewish Representative Council of Ireland, will give his reading. The final solution was the systematic intent by the Nazis and their collaborators to murder every Jew in every country of Europe. Stretching as far north as Norway, as far south as Rhodes, as far east as Russia, and as far west as Ireland. They also included those Jews living in the countries of North Africa. Six million Jews perished in the Holocaust. One and a half million of those victims were children. The Nazis also murdered millions of other victims. But, as Elie Wiesel reminds us, it is true that not all victims were Jews, but all the Jews were victims. We will now hear a Roma song called The Burning Barn. This song was created by a group of Polish Roma who were captured in a town by the Nazis. The Roma could not speak to each other, but they knew other Roma were heading towards the town with their families. They created this song to warn them of the fate that awaited them if they entered the town, and they sang it repeatedly as a warning. This song managed to save Roma lives. It will be sung by Monica Pashkowska. We must prevent future generations from thinking of the Holocaust in terms of anonymous, faceless numbers. Every victim has a name. There are people living in Ireland who have lost cherished family members in the Holocaust and whose names we have included in the scroll of names. For some of them, we know the place of birth, their country of origin, their age, and their place of death. For others, we have only their names and these are included in the scroll. In this small way, we honour their memory and give them a personal Irish memorial. I invite pupils from Stratford College, Dublin, Gorey Community School, Presentation Secondary School, Kilkenny, and St. David's Holy Faith Secondary School, Greystones, to read from the scroll of names. Max Heller. Clara Heller, Gisela Molnar, Sandar Molnar, Baila Hirschberg, Matthias Hirschberg, Rukla Orzel, Fivel Orzel, Slasma Urbach, Hirsch 
Urbach, Tauba Urbach, David Yosef Urbach, Shaul Urbach, Abe Z Urbach, Gitla Freila Urbach, Leila Feigla Urbach, Golda Urbach, Nukum Mordecai Sarah Urbach, Chil Urbach, Simon Urbach, Nuchim Urbach, Fegla Urbach, Perla Urbach, Freimeda Orbach, Moses Klein, Hilda Frankel, Kurt Frankel, Walter Frankel, Herbert Frankel, Fritz Frankel, Zygmunt Frankel, Martin Dan Wolf, Delmont, Wolf Caroline Wolf, Wolf, Sally Wolf, Henrietta Wolf, Rosetta Wolf, Ellie Velvel Avansansky, David Philip, Recha Philip, Leopold Philip, Julia Philip, Dagbert Philip, Louis Philip from Minsk, Valeria Philip, Rosalia Shaimovich, Julius Mayer, Adela Geza Fried, Suri, Oscar Bella Shaimovich, Fried, Katrina Fried, Agnes Fried, Ezekiel Reichenthal, Katerina Reichenthal, Kalmer Reichenthal, Ilona Reichenthal, Gitta Reichenthal, E.B. Reichenthal, Desidier Reichenthal, Ferdinand Alt, Renka Alt, Erna Elbert, Marta Elbert, Paul Joseph Drexler, Drexler Meta Drexler, Drexler, Bella Perlberg, Irma Popper, Yora Mataya, Ifisha Mataya, Ankisha Mataya, Kalman Rosenthal, Eleonora Rosenthal, Abraham Sustiel, Poland Sustiel, David Sustiel, Sheeman Sustiel, Regina Sustiel, Rappe Sustiel, Marta Sustiel, Shabaton Sustiel, Adela Sustiel, Agdenise Sustiel Brudo, Emmanuel Brudo, Sustiel Children, Heinrich Heimbach, Selma Heimbach, Simcha Zachs, Rivka Zachs, Burrell Zachs, Z Zachs, Nachman Zachs, Hannah Zachs, Aaron Zachs, Hannah Sherhai, Leia Zach, Jatel Zachs, Sushana Zachs, Shaina Zachs, Masha Zachs, Rosa Zachs, Tylee Fee Faulkner, David Mayer Faulkner, Moshe Faulkner, Gayla Faulkner, Shane Del Millikman, Yehiel Millikman, Theo Millikman, Joseph Millikman, Milkman, Peppy Gerzib, Haya Millikman, Haim Meyer Millikman, Newson Newt Fockler, Esther Zark Jakubakvic, Mimi Alt Milkman, Levi Falkler, Izzy Falkler, Nathan Falkler, Johanna Carlsberg Summer, Emil Summer, Etty Steinberg, Leon Gluck, Wojciech Gluck, Hatskel Abram, Belia Abram, Ida Kahn, Osea Joseph Heinrich Abram, Herbst, Sigmund Caroline Herbst, Cohn, Els Zimak, Denny Zimak, Abraham Humberg, Emma Humberg, Gerda Feist, Fanny Kaufman, Adolf Humberg, Raphael German, Carl German, David German, Hannah Matwa Zibner, Rivka Zibner, Baby Zulem Zibner, Franla Zibner, Zibner, daughter of Franla Zibner, Shilda Zibler, Joseph Zibner, Mendel Kiersner, Shinabila Kiersner, Ofse Kiersner, Shinariva Kiersner, Shifra Kiersner, Raske Kiersner, Yankel Kiersner, Wanda Camerino, Renato De Corio, Italo Camerino, Julia De Corio, Miriam Naftulovic, Meyer Naftulovic, Sindonia Naftulovic Ova, Hani Moskovic Ova, Haim Moskovic, Benjamin Moskovic, Morik Moskovic, Isidore Moskovic, Shims Shoshon Hertz, Kayla Hertz, Scheindel Hertz, Abraham Hertz, Royza Hertz, Joseph Hertz, Leib Hertz, Meyer Roshovsky, Rachel Roshovsky, Grunia Katshoff, Max Katshoff, Mishla Katshoff, Sioma Katshoff, Dvora Krasnik, Miriam Krasnik, Henna Krasnik, Frega Krasnik, Annie Ottenwolf, David Gleason, Jeanette Gleason, Paul Talma, Sarah Talma, Isaac Shisi, 
Ephraim Sachs, Lena Sachs. Liberation was not always joyful for the survivors of the Holocaust, especially Jewish survivors who had lost everything, their families and their homes. Most had no one left and nowhere to go. Stephen Benedict, lecturer at the National Film School, and youth reader Grace Wolfe will read from the memoirs of Primo Levi and 12-year-old Chava. So for us, even the hour of liberty ran out grave and muffled and filled our souls with joy and yet also with pain. Nothing could ever happen good and pure enough to rub out our past. The scars of the outrage would remain with us forever in the memory of those who saw it, in the places where it occurred and in the stories that we shall tell of it. We had been liberated. I was no longer only a number doomed to die in a Nazi gas chamber, a prisoner without the right to life. Germany had been defeated. Once again, I was an ordinary girl. True, I was different from other girls my age, very different in many ways, but I was free. Dr. Bob Collis worked as a volunteer doctor in the former Bergen-Belsen concentration camp immediately after the war. He brought six Jewish orphans back with him to Ireland. Among those children were brother and sister Terry and Susie Molnar, whom Bob arranged to have adopted by a Jewish couple, Willie and Elsie Samuels. I invite Susie to tell us her story. I was born Susie Molnar in the town of Karzak in Hungary in 1942. We were a small family comprising my brother Gazella, 
my father Sander, my brother Terry, and myself. In 1942, my father was forcibly conscripted into the slave labor service of the Hungarian army and deported to the Soviet Union, where he perished in 1943. Between July and September 1944, in just eight weeks, Adolf Eichmann organized the roundup and deportation of nearly half a million Hungarian Jews. They were sent directly to Auschwitz-Birkenau, where most of them perished in the gas chambers. During these weeks, the Gestapo came for my mother, brother, and me. We were deported first to Ravensbrück and then to Birkenbessen concentration camp. My mother died shortly after liberation. <clears throat> Terry and I were very young children when we came to Ireland. We grew up believing we were the only two members of our family to have survived. In 2007, Terry passed away. I was the only one left. But things changed in 2015, when I was discovered by a first cousin still living in Karjak, and I learned a little bit about my, my family. My father was one of four brothers who, who ran a timber, timber business. Two of them perished in the Holocaust, and two survived. I've also learned that our first cousins living in Hungary and in the United States. I have a family. I have visited Karzak and seen my grandfather's house, the Jewish cemetery where my grandparents are buried, and the synagogue where all my family prayed. 778 Jews lived in Karzak before the war. 461 of them were murdered in the Holocaust. Most important for me is the memorial school on the synagogue wall, recording the Jews from Karzak who perished in the Holocaust. My family is listed on this scroll, but this has to be corrected because my brother and I were not murdered, we survived. Today, I am mindful that time is passing too quickly for my contemporaries and for me. What we experienced took place in the middle of the last century, far too distant for young people today to understand the enormity of what happened. Six million Jews murdered because of their faith, more than the population of Ireland. I urge young people to speak out about hate speech, about bullying, and about Holocaust denial. I implore them to tell our story and to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive. People often ask, how come Jewish people went like lambs to the slaughter during the Holocaust? How come they didn't rebel or resist? Of course they resisted. There were insurrections, revolts and rebellions in most of the ghettos, concentration camps and even in the death camps. All of them failed. Throughout the war there were heroic acts of resistance by individuals, groups and nations. Armed resistance was undertaken by non-Jewish and Jewish partisan groups, such as the Bielski brothers, operating in Belarusia, who protected and saved some 1,200 Jews. The partisans fought the Nazis from the forests and peripheral areas of occupied lands. There was spiritual resistance, where Jews risked their lives to maintain their religious observance in the ghettos and the camps. And there were clandestine movements, such as the White Rose Group, led by students Sophie and Hans Scholl, who were caught and executed 80 years ago in February 1943. On the eve of Passover 1943, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising erupted and lasted 27 days. It was doomed to fail, but the residents in the ghetto chose to fight. 24-year-old Mordecai Anjelovic led the Jewish insurgents of about 700 young fighters, poorly equipped and lacking military training and experience. In the end, 7,000 Jews died in the fighting. 
Some 40,000 Jews were deported from the ghetto to the death camps. The Germans razed the ghetto to the ground and reported to Berlin that the former Jewish quarter in Warsaw was no more. In March 1943, the people of Bulgaria refused to hand over their Jewish communities to the Nazis, although they were unable to save some 11,000 Jews from parts of Macedonia and Thrace. And in September 1943, on hearing that the Jews of Denmark were about to be deported, the people of Denmark rescued their Jewish compatriots by forming a flotilla of every kind of seaworthy vessel to ferry them to safety in neutral Sweden. In 1963, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Remembrance Authority in Israel, inaugurated the Award of Righteous Among the Nations to honor non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jewish people during the Holocaust. I invite Dr. Morris Manning, Chancellor of the National University of Ireland, to tell us about these heroic people. The righteous came from all walks of life and all backgrounds, individuals, groups of friends, families, whole villages, organizations and diplomats. There were nations such as Denmark, Bulgaria and Albania, and the bishop and the mayor of the Greek island of Zaktios who saved their Jewish community. There were also righteous Germans, righteous Arabs, and righteous Muslims, priests and nuns throughout occupied Europe risked their lives to forge documents for Jews, as did diplomats such as Raoul Wallenberg and Sempa Sugihara and many others. Mary Elms is the first Irish person to be awarded the righteous title. Working with her colleagues in the south of France, she and they succeeded in saving some 200 Jewish children from the Nazis. Not only those Jews who have been personally saved by the righteous owe them their lives, but all of their descendants do too. There are thousands of children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. They carry the history of their families on their shoulders. I invite Karina Camarino and Nicola Zin Collis to tell us about their experiences as second and third generation survivors. As a third generation survivor, I sometimes think of how unlikely it is that I exist at all. All four of my grandparents are survivors of the Holocaust. My Romanian grandfather was a prisoner in a work camp until he escaped. My French grandmother was hidden in the countryside with her family and escaped arrest because the entire village conspired to protect them, warning them and hiding them behind a false wall built into a barn whenever soldiers were nearby. My Italian grandmother's family was tipped off by a police commissioner to be out of town on the day the SS rounded up the Jewish people of Rome on the 16th of October, 1943. My Italian grandfather's family was arrested that day and deported to Auschwitz. Of the 1,022 people who were rounded up on the 16th of October, 1943, only 16 people survived. My grandfather, Enzo Camerino, named his son, my father, Italo, and his daughter, Julia, after his own father and mother who were murdered in Auschwitz. All of my grandparents are past now, and I feel responsible to speak out about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. I can't forget that the danger of people harming other people hasn't gone away. This history is not that long ago. I'm raising my son, a fourth generation survivor, to be proud of his culture, his religion, and his family history. We exist because my grandparents survived.
My father, Zoltan, and his sister, Edith, were very young children when they were found in Bergen-Belsen concentration camp by Dr. Bob Collis, who brought them back to Ireland and reared them with his own family. Survivors of the Holocaust have very few relations. We have got used to having very small families, at least from one side. No grandparents, no uncles, no aunts, no cousins. We have been endowed with the title second or third generation, and this brings with it an important responsibility to transmit the memory of the Holocaust to future generations. But we can also rejoice in our own lives, in our own families, our children and our grandchildren. Hitler did not win. One or both of our parents or grandparents survived. And we are here, living our lives, looking towards the future. Thousands of Jewish Holocaust survivors made their homes in Israel after the Second World War. I invite Ambassador of Israel, Liron Bar Sadeh, to tell us about the close connection between Israel and the Shoah. Eighty-four years ago, the Jews of Europe had no safe haven to escape the horrors that were engulfing them. After the Second World War, hundreds of thousands of Jewish Holocaust survivors made their way to the newly established State of Israel. Having experienced great suffering, witnessing the murder and decimation of their families and their communities, the survivors gradually rebuilt their lives. They created, sorry, their lives, their families, and their communities. The survivors gradually also rebuilt their families and they created new generations of their families in their ancient homeland where they felt secure, where they felt safe, determined that the Jewish people would never again be demonized merely for being Jews. Joe Veselsky was born in Czechoslovakia in 1918. When Joe was 20 years old, Hitler invaded and Joe fled to the resistance. At the end of the war in 1945, Joe had lost both his parents and his brother, who were all murdered in Auschwitz. 1942 it was, that's when the transport started. They were the first transports to Auschwitz. But those days, they were talking about working camps for six months. If you would have seen the people who were going to be transported, they bought shoes for work and so on. We didn't have any news. There were rumors that some people were shot, but until Alfred Wetzler escaped from Auschwitz and told us what was happening, we actually didn't. Because it was unbelievable. I mean, absolutely unbelievable. You know, we were worried how our parents will be able to survive the war, working hard there, and so on. We shouldn't have worried, because they were, after arrival, they were, a few days later, murdered. And then I joined the Czechoslovakian brigade up in the mountains. I fought very hard, 44, 45, but it was tough, you know. In my brigade, we had 400 boys, only about 30 came back. Nobody left. I am the last one. Genocides have taken place over the centuries and still occur to this day. I invite Dr. Mark Jones, Assistant Professor of History at University College Dublin, to give his reading.
The Holocaust is the name given to one specific case of genocide that was unprecedented in its totality. The attempt to destroy the Jewish people of Europe and all traces of Jewish culture, history and memory. By the end of the Holocaust, six million Jewish men, women and children had been murdered in ghettos, mass shootings, concentration camps and death camps. The genocide of the Roma took place during the Holocaust, as did the murder of millions of other victims of Nazi atrocities. In all cases of genocide, people have been targeted because of their ethnicity, religious beliefs, or political affiliations. In the 20th century, some of the genocides that took place were in Armenia, Cambodia, Rwanda, and Bosnia. And genocides continue to be perpetrated in our world today. Our thoughts turn to Ukraine and other areas of conflict. Genocide is not a single event in time, but a gradual process that begins when discrimination, racism and hatred are allowed to fester and belligerence takes hold. It is up to all of us to respect one another and to speak out when we hear expressions of hatred or witness injustice. Mr Justice Donal O'Donnell, Chief Justice of Ireland, will tell us about the challenges of rebutting anti-Semitism that we face today. The devastation of the Holocaust left two-thirds of the Jewish people of Europe murdered and brought their culture and history to the brink of oblivion. This left the momentous task of rebuilding Jewish life on European soil. Thankfully, this endeavour has been possible in the decades since uh, in a more united Europe. Gradually, reconciliation replaced mistrust and states began a process of necessary critical self-examination, acknowledging the role that they and their citizens played in the Holocaust. This process, as much as the improving economic conditions, allowed the restoration of the confidence of European Jews. However, while many European states have made great strides in this process, violence, discrimination and prejudice against the Jewish people has yet to be eradicated. Anti-Semitism is a particularly virulent form of racism. It can be communicated through a vast array of means, whether through attacks on Jewish people, their synagogues, schools or businesses, or casual remarks in a workplace, anti-Semitic chants at a football match, or the representation of Jewish people in modern media. The virulence and versatility of anti-Semitism across Europe has been further fueled by the rise of alt-right and white supremacist movements around the world. Social media has been, in many ways, a perfect accelerant for this process allowing the fermentation and dissemination of hate speech and cruelty where extremist rhetoric can develop unchecked and unheeded. The ease with which a tweet or Reddit thread can be shared perpetuates the language of hate with ease, but more concerningly works to normalise such language as demonstrated through its seeping into the national discourse. As a result, ideas which once languished in a fake Facebook groups or the errant tweet in a thread can become mainstream and consequently viewed as somehow acceptable. Recalling the genocidal tragedy of the Holocaust in the last century necessitates addressing the challenge, challenges we face in the present one. Declarations and acts of anti-Semitism were hateful and wrong then 
and remain so in the modern day. Each of us has a responsibility to remember what happened, but so do we each have a responsibility to call out such declarations and acts for what they are, whenever and wherever they are manifested. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for one minute silence as we remember all of the victims of the Holocaust. Thank you. It is customary at Holocaust memorial events to light six candles in memory of the six million Jewish people who perished in the Shoah. In Ireland, we also light candles in memory of all of the victims of the Holocaust. In memory of thousands of people with disabilities and disabling conditions, who were murdered, forcibly sterilized, and starved to death by doctors and other willing helpers. I invite Gary Carney of Disability Federation of Ireland and Dominic Layden of AWARE to light their candles. We will always remember. In memory of the genocide of Roma, which took place during the Holocaust, when more than a quarter of a million Roma and Sinti people were rounded up, murdered, displaced, and forcibly sterilized by the Nazis, I invite Bianca Tanese and Vanessa Pashkovska of the Roma community to light their candles. we will always remember. In memory of ethnic minorities, Poles and other Slavic peoples who were murdered, displaced, forcibly Aryanized, and incarcerated in concentration camps, I invite Salome Mbuaga and Avakidwa and Luisa Rach, whose Jewish grandmother was saved by a Polish Catholic family when she was a young child during the Holocaust to light their candles. We will always remember. In memory of the thousands of gay men and women who were imprisoned in concentration camps where they were subjected to harder work, less food, and greater brutality than other inmates, thousands were murdered. I invite Max Krasinovsky, former Grand Marshal of Dublin Pride, and Sharon Heron of Belong To, to light their candles. We will always remember. In memory of the political victims of the Holocaust, communists, socialists, trade unionists, and political opponents of the Nazi regime who were persecuted and murdered. I invite Alice Mary Higgins and Moira Layden of the Association of Secondary Teachers of Ireland to light their candles. We will always remember. In memory of the Christian victims of all denominations who were persecuted and murdered by the Nazis, I invite Father Vasil Kornitsky of Our Lady of Consolation Church of the Ukrainian Community and the Reverend Yong Nam Park of Rathgar Methodist Church to light their candles.
we will always remember. Six candles are dedicated to the memory of the six million Jewish people, including one and a half million children who were annihilated in the Holocaust. Jews were murdered in concentration camps, labor camps, and death camps. Jews perished in the ghettos. Jews died of starvation and disease. Jews were shot in the forests and in their villages, and Jews were murdered in the streets and in their homes. Those lighting candles in memory of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust are children or grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, second and third generation. All of them lost countless members of their families in the Holocaust. Tony Collis, whose grandfather Zoltan Zinn and great aunt Edith survived Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, but whose other family members perished in the Holocaust. Shelley Weinberger, whose grandparents, Martin and Malvina Weinberger, survived the Shoah, but the Fogel, Glick, and other family members perished in the Holocaust. Jonathan Phillips, whose father Jeffrey escaped Germany on the Kinder, kinder transports, but whose many other family members perished in the Holocaust. Yoram Tokar, whose great uncle David, Aunt Jeanette Galassen, Paul and Sarah Talma, and other family members perished in the Holocaust. Kyla Hertz, whose grandfather, Wolf Hertz, escaped the massacre in the Bronica Forest, and whose great-grandparents, Lenka and Avram Muscovich, survived Auschwitz, but whose other family members perished in the Holocaust. <coughs> Joe Katz, whose mother, Frieda, survived Auschwitz, but whose many family members perished in the Holocaust. we will always remember. As our ceremony draws to a close, Rabbi Lent will read the memorial prayer, which will be sung in Hebrew by Carl Nelken of the Irish Jewish community. Please stand. O oh God, full of mercy who dwells on high, grant proper rest on the sheltering wings of your divine presence among the holy and pure who shine like the brightness of the firmament, for the souls of all the holy and pure and innocent who were killed, murdered, slaughtered, burned, drowned, and strangled at the hands of the Nazi oppressors in Auschwitz, Belzec, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, Chelmno, Majdanek, Sobibor, Treblinka, and other extermination camps in Europe. We now pray for those souls. May their resting places be in the Garden of Eden, and so may the Master of Mercy shelter them for eternity with the cover of his wings, and may he bind their souls in a bond of eternal life. May the Lord be their inheritance, and may they repose in peace upon their heavenly resting places, and let us say, Amen. El mole rachamim shochen bamromim hamesay menu chona chona al kanfe hashchino be'malos ki 
Kedoshimu Taharim Kezahar Rakia Mazirim Es Nishmos Achenu Bene Shenoflubidehorotrim <laughs> Shen <laughs> Professor Thomas O'Dowd will give his closing remarks. It was the survivors themselves who first acknowledged their responsibility for passing on knowledge of the Holocaust and keeping its memory alive. For this reason, it is essential to teach about the Shoah, whether there are Jews in your respective countries or not, whether there are many or few or none left. The Shoah should never be diluted, denied, distorted or trivialized. Our generation and the generation or two after us will be the last that will be able to say that we stood and shook the hands of some of those who survived. Go home from this place and tell your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren that today you looked into the eyes that witnessed the most cataclysmic events ever unleashed by mankind upon mankind. Tell them that you met people who will still be remembered and still talked about and still wept over a thousand years from now. The Holocaust happened and it can happen again. And every one of us has a solemn duty to ensure nothing like it ever happens again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us in this evening of solemn commemoration. <laughs>